Okay, last thing for this unit. In sections 4.1 and 4.2, we're going to do both of these together because they kind of deal with the same thing. Okay, so I know in my math lab and on the syllabus, these are separate sections, but they're all the same bit. Uh, they used to be in the same uh, section in the book until they did a new edition. 4.1, 4.2, we're going to deal with some different attributes of negative exponents. Now, before we do that, what we are going to do is we're going to take a few minutes and we are going to review the, the three properties of exponents. What we do in the next 10 minutes is hopefully review for you. Okay, this is stuff we cover in our introductory algebra class. Okay, so if you, again, if this is not familiar to you, if we need to get you up to speed, talk to me. I've got lots of resources and we can get you there. So there are three properties of exponents that I'm hoping you're familiar with. The first one is called the product rule. The reason I'm just going through and reviewing these is because if you can understand the review of the three properties of exponents, then when we apply them with negative exponents, it's absolutely no different. Okay, so that's why I just want to make sure. The product rule applies in a situation like this. If I have x to the seventh power times, that's why it's called the product rule, x to the fourth power. Who can help me out here? Why the 11? What, what, is the, what is the rule that when you multiply the bases, the bases are the same here. When you multiply the bases, what do you have to do to the powers? Oh, lots of voices. Awesome. So happy. You add the powers. Excellent. Okay, so seven plus four is x to the 11. Okay, you don't do anything to the base. If the bases are different, you can't do anything to the problem. So here are, I've got five quick examples just to review different facets of the product rule. I'm going to give you 90 seconds to just go through and do as much of these five examples as you can. So the first one is y to the third times y to the ninth times y to the sixth. The next one, eight to the fourth times eight to the third. The next one, x times x to the seventh. We move over here. The next one is p to the third times q to the second. And then last but not least, uh, a squared b to the fifth times a to the third b to the sixth. I'm gonna give you 90 seconds, maybe a little more, make as much as you can of those five examples of the product rule. Okay, so the first example, I just wanted to show you that it doesn't matter how many times you're multiplying the base, you do the same thing. So if I have y to the third times y to the ninth times y to the sixth, what is that going to equal? Okay, three plus nine is 12. 12 plus six is y to the 18th. That's absolutely right. Anybody get something different that we need to talk about? Just want to clear up any misconceptions about the properties of exponents before we do the new thing today. This next problem I'm doing because sometimes when we have number bases, we, we do two things instead of just the one thing we're supposed to do. So when I have eight to the fourth times eight to the third, what's the result? Beautiful, yes. The thing about the product rule is you do not change the base. If you wrote down 64, cross it out. 
That is wrong. You do not multiply the bases. You are adding the powers. That is all you need to do. So eight to the fourth times eight to the third is eight. Notice the base has not changed. Four plus three is seven. Great job. Appreciate it. This next one I put on here is just when you have a when you have a term that does not have an exponent written, what is the exponent you assume is there? A one, yes. So I have x to the first times x to the seventh. That's x to the eighth. The purpose of this example right here is I have different bases. Can I apply the product rule to this? No, you do not have anything to the fifth power here. So if you wrote anything after here, that's okay. Don't beat yourself up. We're learning, okay? But that's why I gave the examples. This is done. You cannot go any further with this. And then finally, what happens if I have two bases at the same time? Well, then you just consider them independently. So I have a to the second times a to the third, a to the fifth, and then I have b to the fifth and b to the sixth. That's B to the 11. That is a quick, clean review of the product rule. Before I erase these and go to the second of our three rules, does anyone have a question about the product rule? Is that what you said, two, two, three, two, two? Which one? Uh, one. Yes, it's done. It's P3, Q2. We're done. Okay. Yeah, yes, there was nothing we can do with this one. Okay, I just was making the point here that in order to apply the product rule, the bases have to be the same. If the bases are different, can't do anything with it. Okay, that was the purpose of this example. Any other questions? Okay, well, the next property of exponents. The product rule had to do with what do you do when you multiply the bases. The next one is called the quotient rule. And the word quotient, in case you're not familiar, is just a fancy math word for division. So the quotient rule has to do with what do you do when you divide the bases? So here's my example. If I have x to the ninth divided by x to the fifth, does anybody remember what we do with the, with the exponents when we divide the bases? You subtract, yeah. So this, again, I leave the base alone. I do not do anything at all to the base. I don't cancel it. I don't do anything. I just write it down X. And then nine minus five is four. So again, I've got three examples that I'm gonna write on the board, just of a couple different things that I want you to be aware of. So uh, go ahead and take care of these examples. If I have T to the eighth divided by T to the second, if I have 3 to the 17th divided by 3 to the 5th, and then x to the 7th, y to the 5th divided by x, y to the 3rd. So I'll give you maybe a minute and a half or so to look at those three examples. All right, first one, t to the eighth divided by t to the second. What do you get there? Eight minus two is t to the sixth power. This one I give because I just want to reinforce when you're applying any of these rules, whether it's the product rule we just did or the quotient rule we're doing now, you do not do anything to the base. So when I do this, what is, what's the base of my answer here? Three. Okay, if you canceled the threes and had one, that is wrong. Okay, when we subtract the exponents, we are taking care of the division. So 17 minus 5 is 12. And then this last example again is just what happens if I have different bases? Well, you just combine the ones that are alike. Okay, the, the x's go with the x's, the y's go with the y's. So if I have x to the seventh divided by x, how many x's is that? 
And if I have y to the fifth divided by y to the third, how many y's is that? There you go, x to the sixth times y to the second. That's called the quotient rule. That's what happens when you divide the bases. All right, the last of the three basic properties of exponents that I'm hoping is review, but if it's not, let's talk after class. The last one is called the power rule. It talks about what to do when you have a power raised directly to another power. So for instance, if I have x to the seventh and I'm gonna raise that to the third power, Notice there's no adding, there's no subtracting, it's just a straight, I've got something to a power raised to another power. I'm sorry, what'd you say? Perfect, yes, that is the, that's the power rule. When you have a power raised directly to another power, you multiply just as I was told. Seven times three is X to the 21st power. You're done with that problem. So I've got three examples of this for you to do. Again, I have a purpose with each of these examples. so. Uh, so make sure if you have a question, if something's not super clear or apparent to you that you are asking. So if I have x to the fifth raised to the sixth, you can do that. If I have three and then uh, three y to the, let's not make that the same number, three y squared, and we're going to raise that to the fourth. And then finally, two x squared over y to the eighth, and we're raising that whole thing to the third power. Give you a minute or two to to sort through those. Okay, so the first one is x to the fifth raised to the sixth. This is just a straight power rule problem. You've got something raised to a power, raised directly to another power. So this is going to be x to the five times six or 30th power. This problem right here, I wanted to do because I don't want you to forget that we have two things being multiplied in here. Most common mistake, I'm guessing that half, if not more of you wrote the following down. You wrote down 3y to the 8th. If you wrote down 3y to the 8th, you are almost right. You've done half the problem. Okay, you've taken care of the y. But don't forget that the 3 has an exponent. What's the exponent on the 3 as it appears right here? Yeah, a 1. When there's not an exponent on something, the 1 is assumed. Okay, so you can't forget that. It's the most common mistake in exponents. Generally, students in my classes do pretty well with the exponent stuff. Okay. And with that exception. So if you can drill that into your mind right now that there's an exponent of one on this three, that's going to help. So now one times four is four. I've got three to the fourth. Now I'm not super fussy. I'm fine if you leave it like that, but I believe my math lab will want you to pop that into your calculator, three to the fourth power. Uh, so when you do that, three times three times three times three is going to be 81. As an aside, before we do the other problems, if you don't know how to do, if you don't have to know how to evaluate exponents in your calculator, talk to me after class. Okay, it'd take us two seconds to go through and show you how to work the button. Uh, if you have, uh, everyone in here probably has a Texas Instruments or a Casio calculator would be my guess. Uh, the Texas Instruments calculators either have one of two buttons that you're going to use. Either there's one with a little half triangle here, it's called a carrot, that's a power. So what you would do if you wanted to do three to the fourth power is you would hit the number three, then you hit the carrot button, and then you hit four, and it would tell, then hit equal, and it'll tell you 81 if that, that's the button you have. 
Other Texas instrument calculator and all the Casio ones that I've ever seen have a button that says X to the Y power, like that. And so you'll hit, it's the same order of operations. You'll hit three, and then you'll hit this X to the Y button, then you'll hit four, and then it'll tell you 81. Okay, so if you don't know what you have on your calculator, you can't identify it, let me know. Uh, take care of that because I don't want there to be any uh, anything in the way of you getting the answers you need to get. Yes. No, I am fine. If you leave it three to the fourth and Y to the eighth, I'm fine with that. Okay, it's totally good with me. Okay, but if you want to get the right answer on my math lab, I'm pretty sure they want you to evaluate the exponents when you can. Okay, so this last one, just wanted to again give you an example of a fraction, and then we've got another number here. So I'm going to write the two is two to the first power, just so I don't forget accidentally. <coughs> so I've got two to the one times three is three. I'm going to leave it like that, but that's eight. The calculator will tell you that's eight. I've got x to the two times three or six, and then y to the eight times three or 24. And that is the answer to that problem right there. All right, before we get on with the new stuff for the day, one more thing to mention about exponents, since I'm on a roll talking about exponents. A zero exponent. We have an exponent of zero. So for instance, if I have 12 raised to the zero power, another commonly missed little bit of math trivia. Anything to the zero power, anybody remember what this is? Boom, yes. Anything to the zero power is one. It's always one. It's not zero, most common mistake. You're not multiplying these numbers together. Okay, that's why I asked the question. So if I give you this on the test, which I might, so it'd be good to be paying attention. If I say what's 1,142, but I'm gonna raise it to the zero power, then you are gonna write down that the answer is one, yes, perfect. Anything to the zero power is one. No thought required, you just need to remember uh, what the zero exponent is. Okay, so I don't want there to be confusion on that. So just kind of remember it. All right. Woo, that's our review of exponents. Now we can finally get to all right, negative exponents, the fun stuff, the new stuff. If you've seen this, great. I don't assume you have. I'm going to go back to the quotient rule. We're going to we're going to see where negative exponents come from. So the quotient rule, remember, is when you divide the bases, you subtract the exponents. So here's a problem. Let's say that I have x to the third divided by x to the, let's say, seventh power. x to the third divided by x to the seventh. This is the new stuff, or I'm assuming it's the new stuff. So if you have any questions, please bring them up. Quotient rule. We already talked about the quotient rule. Quotient rule says that when I am dividing the bases, I subtract the exponents. And if you need to pop out your calculator, what is three minus seven? What does that give me? Uh-oh, a negative exponent. So what does that mean? Well, that's a great question. What does that mean? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this problem another way so that we can see what this means. So I'm just going to draw a little arrow. I'm going to do this problem another way x to the third, x to the third means I have x times x times x, I have three of them. x to the seventh means how many x's do I have? x times x times x, that's four, that's five, that's six, that's seven. It's nice that we have the quotient rule so we don't have to walk around drawing all these x's all the time. But here's the thing, if I have three X's in the top and I've got seven in the bottom, I can do a little cancel, right? I can do a little division. How many X's can I cancel on both the top and the bottom of this? Three. So I can get rid of you, get rid of you, and get rid of you. How many X's does that leave me? 
what did you say? Perfect. Where are they? On the bottom. That's the key. Okay. So I have I have nothing left on the top. So when I divide, I put a one there, and then I have one, two, three, four. I have x to the fourth. So this now tells me what a negative exponent means. A negative exponent is telling you a position. Okay. So I'm going to write that. A negative exponent is telling you a position. It's telling you that where your base should be. So x to the negative fourth is equal to one over x to the fourth. They're the same thing. So this is the general principle I'm going to write down for you. Okay, this is the new bit of information that we're going to practice. That if you have any base raised to the negative n power, I think our book uses the letter n there, or r, yes, n. That the way you resolve a negative exponent is you say, okay, when you have a negative exponent, it is telling you that the base is in the wrong place. So I'm going to, whoops, I'm going to do one over a to positive n power. These two things mean the same. So this is the key bit of information for today. That is the rule for negative exponents. And the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to practice that some. We're going to practice taking some things with negative exponents and we're going to practice writing that with positive exponents. Okay, so I've got six examples that I'm going to have you do. Okay, the only thing you have to do is resolve the negative exponent. I've got a purpose for each of these, these examples. So if you miss something, remember it's okay, we're learning. Mistakes are opportunities to learn, they help you learn. So don't get upset and frustrated with yourself. So in each of these, you're just applying the definition, you're resolving the negative exponent. So the first one is going to be uh, y to the negative six power. Then if you have five to the negative two power, and then if I have x to the negative three and y to the positive five power, three p to the negative two, Uh, then I'm going to have um, one over y to the negative seventh. And then the last one is going to be a to the negative three over b to the negative two. Okay, so I've got a little something for each of those problems. Do the best you can. All right, so I want to resolve the negative exponents. And again, there's things to learn here. So if you made a mistake, it's okay. So first thing, y to the negative six. What, how should I rewrite that? One over y to the six. Okay. Questions, comments, concerns so far? All I did was apply my new little bit of information that we have right here. Five to the negative two. What does it become? 
Perfect. Love it. And again, that's fine for me. I'm golden with that. You don't have to do any more when you take the test on Monday. Uh, but on my math lab, when you do your homework over the weekend, they're going to want you to take the five second, five times five, and make it 25. All right, the reason I gave this problem is the negative exponent only applies to the base it's near. Which one of these has the negative exponent? The x. So here's my fraction bar. That means what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the x to the negative third. It's going to go in the bottom, become x to the third, right? Does the y have a negative exponent on it? No. So where's the y going to be? On top. Yep. Great job. Anybody tricked up by that? Anybody not see it now that we've talked about it? Please speak. Don't be shy. I'm not going to hurt you. I don't think I could. Okay, the next one. So it's, this is the same thing. Again, I always find it helpful when I have my numbers to make sure I put the power on them. So I'm going to put the power on the three. It's three to the first power. So once again, which one of those has the negative exponent on it? The P. So the P goes in the denominator, it becomes P squared. The three stays in the numerator. Most common mistake on this problem, I'm guessing somebody in here wrote it, is you put the whole thing, one over three P squared. Okay, and if you did that, the thing to notice, what I want you to remember is the negative two, since there's no parentheses, is only applying to the P. Okay, that's all it has uh, power over there. The three to the first, it stays, stays where it is. It has its own power. Okay. Well, since we've talked on all of these problems about when I have a negative exponent in the numerator and I put it in the denominator, I just wanted to make mention that you might do a problem that has a negative in the denominator. Well, if you had to guess, maybe you didn't know what to do with it, but if you had to guess, what do you think you're going to do with this negative exponent? And where is it going to be? It's already in the denominator. So yes, I'm going to put it at the top. So I just flip it now up to the top. Okay, the negative exponent tells me the base is in the wrong place. So it's just going to be y to the positive 7. And then again, I just repeated that same sort of thing. I've got a to the negative 3 divided by b to the negative 2. So both bases are in the wrong place because they're both negative. So the a to the negative 3 is going to go to the bottom, become a to the third. The b to the negative 2 is going to go up to the top and become positive b squared. Okay, that's phase one of negative exponents. Anybody got anything that we need to dive into a little more detail before we go to phase two? All phase two is going to be, and we're going to do this for the next 20 minutes or so, maybe a little longer before we hit the very last thing for the day. The next 20 minutes, we're going to go back through the properties of exponents that we just talked about, we reviewed, and we're just going to throw in some negatives just to see Make sure we can do it. It doesn't change anything uh, as far as our process is concerned. So here goes. I'm going to start off with an example. Okay, so here's my first example. Let's say that I have x to the uh, x to the fifth times x to the negative ninth. This is product rule. I'm multiplying my bases. And we just reviewed this. It might be in your notes if you wrote this down. When we multiply the bases, what do we do to the exponents? We add them. Yes, we add them. Product rule, when you multiply the bases, when you have a multiply sign here, you add the exponents. So I'm going to have x to the, go with your calculator if you need to, 5 plus negative 9 is negative 4. And then the only thing you have to remember is we don't leave our exponents negative. Okay, we just resolve this. So x to the negative 4 is 1 over x to the 4. It's the same properties of exponents we just reviewed. Only now some of these problems might have negatives involved in them. So here's one just like that for you. Let's say that you have y to the negative 8 times y times y to the 4th. 
Perform that operation, please. Product rule, we add the exponents. Okay, we are multiplying the bases. That's what these dots mean. So I'm going to have y to some power. So here goes negative eight plus one becomes negative seven. Negative seven plus four. What is my final result? Negative three. Negative three, indeed. So if we got there, you've done a fantastic, beautiful job. We're almost done. The last thing to do is to resolve that negative exponent, and it becomes one over y to the third. Here is, uh, here's an example of the quotient rule. Uh, I'm going to work this one for you, then I got a couple for you to do. With the quotient rule, just be super careful when you are subtracting negatives. It sometimes throws us for a loop when we've got a subtract and we've also got a negative number. So for instance, let's say I have five to the fourth divided by five to the negative three. Okay, five to the fourth divided by five to the negative three. I want to do this problem. I'm going to apply the quotient rule to it. If you need to write the subtraction down, then by all means, please do that. Okay, so here goes. I am going to write the subtraction down here for you. So I've got five, and then I'm subtracting. I'm taking four minus a negative three. I'm going to write that down. It's four minus, the minus is because it's a quotient. I subtract the exponents, and then the negative three is because the bottom one is a negative. Four minus negative three. Well, when I subtract the negative, what's that the same thing as doing? Anybody remember? Yeah, two negatives make a positive. So this is really four plus three, and that is the five to the seventh power. Here is, uh, here's one for you. I got a couple problems that you're going to do just like this. So I would like you to do this first one. Let's say that you have a to the negative third divided by b to the sixth power. Right, again, I'm going to write down the subtraction. You've got your calculator. There's no reason for you to miss the arithmetic because you can use calculators in this class. So here we go. We've got A. The, the top exponent is negative 3. Then I am subtracting the bottom exponent, which is 6. So negative 3 minus 6. And when you throw that, that in your calculator, negative 3 minus 6 more is negative 9. And that becomes 1 over A to the ninth power. Here's another one, practicing our subtracting. This next one is x to the eighth divided by x to the negative fifth.
Again, I'm going to subtract. I've got x. The top exponent is 8 minus because it's a division problem. And the bottom exponent is a negative 5. So once again, I'm subtracting a negative. So that's 8 plus 5, or in other words, x to the 13th power. So we've talked, we've done a couple problems with product rule, we've done a couple problems with quotient rule. Here's a couple of power rule problems. And then the last two or three problems we do will be combinations of, of these, these rules. Nothing really changes. It's just being careful with these signs. So here's the next problem. I'm going to have you do this one. You don't need me for this one. Let's say you have two to the negative third power, and then you raise that to the negative fifth power. When I have a power raised directly to another power, what operation do I use here? Perfect. Okay, it's the same rule as before. Don't let the negatives mess you up. So I've got two, negative three times negative five is positive 15. Okay, great job. Here's another one. It's just like the problems we did previously, just with some different exponents. So if I have five x to the fourth, y to the negative third, and I'm going to raise that to the negative second power. Right, so we did a problem just like this with the positive exponents. So it's the it's the same thing. I'm going to put a one on the five so I don't forget to raise it to the power as well. Okay, that again is the most common mistake my students make. So I'm trying to overemphasize that. So I have five to the one times negative two or negative two. I have x to the four times negative two or negative eight. And then a y to the negative three times negative two or positive six. If you got there, you've done a fantastic job. Just don't forget that simplifying means I have to resolve these negative exponents. So here's my fraction bar. Where's the five to the negative two going to go? Bottom. Five to the second or 25. I'm not going to rewrite it. The x to the negative eight, where's it going to go? Bottom. Indeed, x to the eighth, and then y to the sixth, where's it going to go? There you go, there's your answer. Lovely. Here's another one. Another problem that we did a few minutes ago that had positive exponents. I'm just including some negatives, so it's not anything uh, that you haven't seen before yet. So it is this six x to the negative two divided by y to the fifth, and we're going to raise that whole thing to the negative four power.
All right, so once again, I'm going to put a one on the six here, just so I remember that it already has an exponent. So I have six to be one times negative four is negative four. I have x to be negative two times negative four is positive eight. And then y to the five times negative four or negative 20. Again, first step accomplished. You've done all the heavy lifting and hard work. Here's my fraction bar. The six is raised to the negative four. So that means it goes to the bottom, becomes six to the fourth. The x is raised to the positive eight. So that means it's in the right place. So I'm going to leave x to the eighth up top. And then the y to the negative 20, that is in the bottom. So now the y to the negative 20 also gets listed, lifted to the top. It becomes y to the 20. So there we go. Yes. The negative exponent tells me that the base is in the wrong place. So since it's in the denominator, it gets moved to the numerator. Okay, that's the, that's the pr uh, principle of these negative exponents. When you have a negative exponent in the top of a fraction, it moves to the bottom and becomes positive. When you have a negative exponent in the bottom of a fraction, it moves to the top and becomes positive. Okay, great question. Good clarifying question. Love it. All right, here's the next problem for you. We did, again, we did a problem just like this, but it had positive exponents. So we're just throwing in some negatives here. Let's say we have x to the fifth, y to the negative two in the top, and then x to the eighth y to the negative three in the bottom. Okay, so it's a pair of quotient rule, rule problems thrown all into one. All right, so this is just the quotient rule applied twice. So I have x to the five minus eight. You put that in your calculator. Five minus eight is negative three. And then you have y to the negative two minus negative three. I'm just gonna write my scratch work right above here. I have negative two is the first exponent. I'm subtracting because that's what the quotient rule says to do. And then I have negative three is the bottom exponent. So negative two minus negative three is negative two plus three or one is what your calculator will tell you for that. And then finally, last but not least, I do have a negative exponent that I have to resolve. So my X to the negative third goes to the bottom becomes X to the third. The Y to the first stays up top and is Y in the first. Okay, just two more problems with negative exponents and then we will roll into the finish line of the the content that is actually in section 4.2, but is related to negative exponents. It's all kind of one concept going on here. So here's your second to last negative exponent problem example that we're going to do. I would like you to do uh, x divided by 2, and we're going to raise that whole thing to the negative 4 power.
All right, so again, I don't see any exponents on these things in parentheses that I've given you. So ones are implied. That's always the case when there's not an exponent directly written. So what I have in the top is x to the one times negative four or negative four. In the bottom, it's two times two to the one times negative four or negative four. Both exponents are negative. So I'm going to take the x to the negative fourth. It's going to go to the bottom, become x to the fourth. The two to the negative fourth goes to the top, it becomes two to the fourth. And if you wanted to write the top 16, that's fine. Uh, I'm good with it staying two to the fourth though. So that, here is your last problem, but that's the bulk of our stuff. Any questions before I give you this last um, working with the properties of exponents thing? All right, so this one's gonna have a bunch of steps just because I wanna end on a, on, a, on a bang here. So I'll tell you how to get started on this. We've got two x to the second over y to the second, and we're gonna raise that to the third. So that's all one thing. Resolve that first, and then times five x to the negative two over y raised to the negative two. So basically, I just put two problems side by side, and then we will multiply them. So use the power rule here on the left, use the power rule here on the right. And then if you don't know what to do after that, that's fine, but you're gonna do some quotient rule and stuff, but we'll, we'll finish it out together. I'm gonna to run and get a drink of water while you're doing starting on that. I'm going to get started on this and I'm going, to, I'm going to do the first kind of step and then I'm going to give you some time to finish it up because I know there's a lot to this problem. So the, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of the parentheses using the power rule and we'll, we'll take care of that and then I'll, I'll leave you there and give you another minute or two to, to take it to the finish line. So each of these problems individually, you've already done a couple of problems like this individually. 
The only difference here is I've smooshed them together into a bigger problem. So what we're going to do here in this first one is I'm going to put a one on there. And so I've got two to the one times three or third power, X to the two times three or sixth power, Y to the two times three or sixth power. Okay, so that's, we've done a problem just like that when we reviewed the properties of exponents. Times. Now I've got, again, I've got a one right here. So I've got five to the one times negative two or negative two. X to the negative two times negative two or four. And then Y to the one times negative two or negative two. So then you know, there's, there's actually there's like three or four different things you can do at this point. Yes. Yeah, I was just, I just did the first step, but you're totally right. And that's what I was going to say is you've got a couple different things you can do on this problem. You can do what I was just told and let's resolve these negative exponents like we've been doing and then finish the problem. Or since it's a multiplying, you can multiply these and use the power, uh, excuse me, use the product rule. So you have a couple different options that are both not wrong. I'm going to take your advice though. So let's do that. So I've got two X to the sixth, Y to the sixth times. The five to the negative two is going to go to the bottom and be five squared. The X to the fourth stays in the top. And then the Y to the negative two is going to go up to the top and become Y squared. Oops, I left something off. The two at the third power. Sorry, my bad. All right, so let's finish this up. Just to, there's two steps left. The two to the third, two times two times two, that's eight. In the top, I have x to the sixth times x to the fourth. What do you get when you do x to the sixth times x to the fourth? It is x to the third. You're exactly right. Great job. Thank you. Then I've got my y's. I've got y to the two up top. I've got y to the sixth on the bottom. What's uh, what's two minus six? Because they're they're being divided. Two minus six is what? Negative four. Yeah. So it's, I'm just going to write over here on my scratch paper. It's y to the negative four, and that negative four tells me to put it down on the bottom. So y to the fourth. Then the other thing in the bottom is five squared. Five squared is five times five or 25. So I'll put a 25 right there. That's a difficult problem because of there's a lot of steps involved. If I had given you just this, I, I feel pretty good that you could do it because we've already done a problem like that. If I gave you just this, I feel like you could do it. We've already done several problems like that. But then there's the extra step then of simplifying the stuff that, that remains. So that uh, that made that problem a bit more difficult. So that is our run through of uh, negative exponents and their properties. So we're almost to the finish line today. There's one more thing to talk about, one more, uh, one more bit about exponents that I need to tell you, and then we will be done. I don't know what you have going on for science classes if you're taking any sort of chemistry or physical science or biology or what, but this is something an application of exponents and negative exponents that's that's really useful and you'll see quite a bit the more the more science stuff you do you guys are you're doing stem you're in, in uh, intermediate algebra so I'm assuming that's where your destiny lies. So this and this is what this is in section 4.2 on my math lab it's called scientific. Notation. What scientific notation does is it gives us a way to do things like comparing numbers easily, working with uh, large or really small numbers by multiplying and dividing them really easy. All we are going to focus on here is putting numbers uh, written out normally into scientific notation and vice versa, just getting used to that process. Okay, so for instance, if you were in an astronomy class, you would be told that the distance from the Earth to the sun is 93 million miles. Okay, that's a lot of miles. So what we want to do, because 
working with this many zeros, you go in your calculator and your calculator won't do it anymore. If you multiply this by, by 100 or something, your calculator is going to give you an error because it can't fit it on the screen. So what we're going to do is learn how to write this in, 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 a, in a different way. This is called scientific notation. And there's two bits to scientific notation. Okay, the first bit over here is going to be a, <coughs> excuse me, a number with just one digit to the left of the decimal. Okay, so the first part of scientific notation is a number with one digit left of the decimal. There's a number with one digit to the left of the decimal. So you're going to have the number one through nine, not zero, one digit, one through nine to the left of the decimal place. So here's what I'm going to do. I want my decimal for 93 million. I just want to have one decimal to the left of the decimal place. So that, that, that digit is going to be nine. So my number here is going to be 9.3. Then you're going to write an X for multiplication. In scientific notation, you don't use a dot. Okay, you use a little X. And then the other bit to scientific notation is you're going to have what's called the magnitude, meaning the power of 10. How many, how many places did you move the decimal to get to its new place? So I moved the decimal to, to behind the nine. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to count. And so here we go. We go one power of 10, two. Three, four, five, six, seven. I move that decimal place seven powers of ten. So it's going to be ten to the seventh power over here. So basically, what this is saying is that this is nine point three ten millions. Okay, that's ten to the seventh. It's just the place notation of of 10 million. That's scientific notation. What it allows you to do is you can then quickly compare numbers by order of magnitude. You can multiply and divide numbers that are in scientific notation way easier than if they're in this, this notation right here. So here's a first problem for you. Uh, here is a number 234 billion. Like the national debt or something. Lots, lots of zeros. 234, and then there's nine zeros after it, if you're writing that down. 234 billion. So I would please like you to write 234 billion in scientific notation. Okay, so you always have one digit to the left of the decimal place. So what is the initial decimal I'm going to have? I think you said it. Perfect. Thank you. I'm an old man. I don't hear well. 2.34. Beautiful. One non-zero digit. It's always going to be a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or 9. You're never going to have 10. You're never going to have more than one digit. Scientific notation has one digit, not zero. Okay, and then times 10 to the, and I move the decimal 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 11 places. That's a real big number. Our last couple of examples, what happens if you have a real small number? So you're in biology class and you've measured the diameter of a cell. 
So this is a decimal point, and I've got six zeros and then six seven. Six zeros and then six seven. All right, so what is the first non zero digit that I have as I'm reading this number? Six. So my, my scientific notation is going to start off with 6.7 times. And then I've got my magnitude. Now, here's the thing really big numbers were positive powers of 10. Really small numbers are going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is a decimal, it's a fraction. So it's going to be a negative seven. This is telling you that this, this is a some what's tens, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, hundred thousands, millions, ten millions. Okay, so this is ten millions. This is the one time we do not resolve the negative. We leave the negative exponent negative in scientific notation. Here's your last example, and then I got a couple closing words for you. So uh, this is same sort of thing. We're going to have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, one, three, one. There's ten zeros after the decimal, and then one, three, one. How are you starting the scientific notation out? What's the first non zero digit I get to? Not quite. Be careful. 1.31. I heard you say, if I heard wrong, forgive me. I heard you say 13.1, not 13. Always one digit to the left of the decimal, one digit right here. Okay, never 13.1, never 131. Common mistakes, but that's not scientific notation. Okay, it's something else. Okay, times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. I move the decimal 11 places backwards. So that is going to be what, uh, what exponent? Perfect. Great job. 